And yes, we're in. Now you'll see that I'm smiling uh, because <laughs> I've got um, actually my oldest friend on the planet. Boom. He's not the oldest person I know, but he is quite old, as you can see. He's my oldest friend and he's taking a, a, a swig of water just to, I suppose, get a grip of the fact that here we are talking to each other all these years on. So, yes, Jed Stevenson is in the clearing. <laughs> the sound of one man clapping is something you're very familiar with. I'm very, sure. very, yeah. So we used to share a flat in Cricklewood when we were at the Central School of Screech and Trauma. We were in Teacher 86, which is, I suppose, ageing is both deliciously there. That was the 82 to 86 uh, academic year, as we were called. Uh, so, yes, how's Mawal? How are you today? Jed of the Jed Ski Stevenson. What was the first word? How's what? How's Mawal? Morale. How are oh, you? All right, thank you. Yeah, I'm speaking, yeah good, thanks. Oh, I'm doing yes. English on the Zoom podcast, if that's OK. Are you? No, that's cool by me, right? Yeah. Uh, always good, thank you, sir. And um, and how are you? All the better for talking to you. And you, you're looking taller than I remember on screen. Yeah, I am. I've grown significantly, not just that way. I'm, I can assure you. Because in real life, you're only about three inches tall, but you're looking two, very two and a half. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. Your, your height's always been very helpful for you. Because one of my first memories of you was playing football with you, and I came to um, Darlington to your homeland. And uh, you ran past me and punched me in the bollocks, I remember. <laughs> I was trying to swat a fly out the way and you just, you've always accused me of doing something else. Wonderful. So, yes, you, we've asked you the how are you, so let's get straight on with the uh, wonderful storytelling metaphors of this What You Need Is A Good Listening To podcast. So what's a clearing like for you, Gerard Jed Stevenson? <laughs> um. Well, it has to be a space, doesn't it? A place. Okay. Or well, wherever the place is, it has to have my guitar there. And by the way, it can be a metaphor as well, because people go in their heads to find that space. But, sorry. Uh, it's a, it... I really wouldn't recommend going in my head. Um, it's A guitar has to be there wherever, and not just any guitar. As you know, I've got many guitars. Um, you have. I love them all. And they're all looking at me right now. But um, my Echo Ranger 6, which I bought secondhand in 1978, is the one that I write most of my songs on. And it's really, really weird how I can and I have written songs on other instruments. Yeah. But the Echo Ranger 6, my particular one, that I've taken all around the world, uh, I can just pick it up and have a song in five, ten minutes. It's, it's um, There is something extraordinary about which is going to sound really tossy in it, but I'm a relationship between me and that guitar. So that's yeah, going to be there. I really like that. It's sort of got your DNA attached to it because it's been with you, with you, with you, sort of almost, I, I know in 1978, you won't have been literally a boy, but sort of man and boy attached to the instrument of choice. Yeah, and I've written hundreds of songs on it. And I can, and I haven't got a clue, funny if I was watching Sting this morning talking about the songwriting process. And he said what I would say, which is I've written hundreds of songs and I haven't got a clue how it happens. Um, I mean, he's particularly famous for dreaming every breath you take, apparently, and just waking up and just putting it on the paper. Yeah, yeah. And same with McCartney and all the great songwriters. You, you never get a definitive answer. I know there's all these courses about how to write songs, but, you know, I just don't know how you do them. And I, I've been doing them for a long time now. But the, the Echo Ranger 6 kind of just tells me, you know, we need to write a song today, Jed, and it picks itself up and... Out comes the song, whether it's good or bad, we just have to write it. It's kind of cathartic in many ways. So so that has to be there. And I guess if I was going to be in a space, it would be in a cafe in Krakow. Ah, yes. And indeed, I'm in, fully intending to, well, I was expecting you to talk about Krakow because of your great, great yeah. love. Yes. And it's that was me that just mentioned it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for the prompt. Yeah. Because I, I do know that it's your favourite place on the planet, so it makes complete sense. Because you've been there how many times now? Oh, I in the 40s wow unlike yeah. you if i may say so <laughs> yeah i'm um, not, not yet there yeah yeah <laughs> 39 and looking beautiful yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. so you i love the fact that you're you, do you call it an echo ranger six was the name that's of what it's called yeah i yeah, don't call it that that's his name yeah yeah i mean it's 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 a perfect name because it almost sounds like a sort of um a futuristic avatar of a, a vehicle through which you write music fantastic yeah it's not it's just a guitar but um, and it, it fits in your head. You were saying wherever my space is, it's got to have a guitar in it. So I look forward to yeah. shoving your Echo Ranger 6 in your ear when I next see you. 
Cheers, mate. Yeah. No, yeah, I just have to. That'll be revenge for the kick in the bollocks circa 1982. I look forward to it, Chris. Yeah. Yeah. No, I have to have it. Yeah. Lovely. And when was the last time you wrote a song on it? Uh, about two weeks ago when um, I hadn't written a song for ages. And that's because I'm in the middle of selling my house. So my Echo Ranger 6 was at my other house. Uh, but I had about four or five of the more expensive ones here in where I'm now staying. And then there was um, something on Facebook on the uh, Richard Digens page asking people uh, to contribute songs, uh, kind of protest songs, or how they felt about what's going on at the moment with COVID and with the government. And I wanted to do that. So I went and got my Echo Ranger 6. I brought it home thinking I'd leave it in the corner until I had the, you know, the, um, could find the muse. But in fact, I picked it straight up. And 10 minutes later, I posted on, on the Facebook page the song written the lyrics, the ch you know, everything and recorded it. And I will ask you at the very end where we can find out more about you um, on the at the internet. So th I'll, I'll definitely allow a section so we can look out that sort of film. And I haven't yet, you know, described what you do. But if, if, if you are at your cafe of choice that you like to go to, and if, if someone doesn't have a frame of reference for you and just sits next to you and said, what do you do? What's your favourite way of answering that? I hate that question. Uh, well, these days I'm a, I, it's, I'm a theatre practitioner, which is how I started before I met you, as you know. So I started out as an actor, did four years. Um, and then I won't bore you about the reasons, but I ended up going to Central to train when I met you. Um, then went into education for 30 years, 30 odd years. But throughout that time, kept one foot in the door of the profession. So I kept taking sabbaticals to go on tour in shows such as Waiting for Godot and, and various things like that. And then most of my holidays were spent doing professional work. And then about four and a half years ago now, I was working in the HE sector and decided I'd had enough and went back to my first love, theatre practitioner. So I'm a performer, singer, songwriter, uh, writer. Uh, but I think these days, more than anything, director. So I direct a lot of stuff. That, was that too long an answer? No, no, a, gr a great, very comprehensive answer. And, and, and you're very, very drawn to Polish theatre because of your favourite practitioner. Uh, yeah, Billy Smart. He was a great Polish <laughs> practitioner. And uh, not a lot of people know that he was Polish. Uh, <laughs> Billy Smartskiewski, tremendous guy. He changed his name uh, to get more success. You're him. known as Jedski as well, I know, I mean, affectionately. Yeah, now I'm, tr I'm drawn to European theatre. Yeah, uh, that doesn't mean I don't like other theatre, and not just European theatre. I also like a lot of Asian theatre. People like uh, Ninagawa, the great uh, uh, Japanese director. But my favourite, the one you're alluding to, is yeah, Tadeusz Kantor. Yeah, yeah, massive, massive um, inspiration for me. And you took me to uh, Krakow uh, to go and see the theatre space he worked in, which yeah. is an incredibly memorable trip. Um, it was very, very deep midwinter cold a, a cold i hadn't actually experienced the nature of before sort of bone chillingly cold and I, it's a very very memorable and quite dark because it, it it's not a dark place but it was just the low light and and the sort of eastern european feel to the theater because it, it, it's it's linked to theater of the oppressed but you can tell us more um what's it there to to define yeah, I'm not really sure it's linked to the oppressed, the oppressed, but the world's oppressed. But um, what was the question? What's it there to define? Well, what, what, how, what's your draw to, to Cantor as, as a practitioner? Oh, gosh, I don't know. I don't know. I've been writing a book for ages about him, which will probably never get published because uh, a very good friend of mine, who I think you met, Bogdan, Bogdan yeah. Rentinski, keeps saying, you know, Jed, write, write about you and Cantor. But it's really hard because I don't quite know why. I first heard a cantor, I think late 70s, I was at the Edinburgh Festival, and he was there, uh, and I didn't get to see him. I, the, the word on the street was that this Polish guy, director, had brought a bit of theatre over, but he was still on stage while he watched the performance. And we were all kind of, that's, that's ridiculous, that's crazy, what's he doing? So I never bothered going to see him, much of my regret. But I don't know what it is that uh, he is the most... His work uh, is, yeah, can be perceived as very dark and really powerful, and yet has a wicked sense of humour. It's, it's also very funny, very witty. 
Um, I like the fact that he kind of took an idea, Edward Gordon Craig's idea of the Uber marionette. Because, you know, if you take a bunch of actors and I'm starting rehearsing with uh, another set of actors next week, directing them in three different plays, you're bringing in three, uh, you're bringing in, in my case next week, four actors who bring other things in the room. And as a director, you've got to work around that, which can be great at times. But Cantor liked to see everything as an object, not just the, the set or the props. He saw the actors as, as um, objects as well. And I like that. And I like that, man, not manipulation, but that um, recognition that everything has a memory. So you put something in a space and you automatically bring the memory of that object, whether it's a human being or pen. I remember doing with, with my students at university years ago, something which I got them to look uh, at various things, including a pen I put in the room. And they looked at it, it was a pen and blah, 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 blah. And then towards the end of the session, I pointed out that that was the, the pen that I use every year to write down their grades for their final classification. And actually that is really significant because that's going to almost decide whether they get a first or two or one, or, you know. Yeah, yeah. And they looked at the pen in a completely different way. So it's um, it wasn't that pen, by the way. That's its sister. Um, so reframing the idea of just a pen as an inanimate object and then actually it's got much more depth, texture and history to it. Well, it makes you appreciate uh, set design apart from anything else, but it makes yeah. you appreciate the way you're looking at it. You're looking at the whole thing, but just the actors who sometimes might be getting off on their ego. It's actually about um, everything and the shape and the, you know, the feeling. And, and what I also liked about Cantor is he would stand in the, um, the front of the audience, watching the audience come in. And you know, it says on the program, show starts at 7.30. Well, not with Cantor. It would be ready to start at 7.30, but he'd be waiting until he felt the audience were in the room. Ah, uh, yes. You know, so, you know, we've all had it when you're, the lights come up and he can tell the audience aren't yet settled. He'd wait until he felt he had them and then he'd just give a signal and start. And he, yeah, I just... So very, very attuned to the notion of presence and when you're truly, truly present, then we will begin. And yeah, then it's a happening. Then it's a real, you know, I mean, he's, he's known for something called Theatre of the Dead, which a bit like uh, Artaud's kind of uh, Theatre of Cruelty is very mis misunderstood. Uh, term it's not about dead it sounds very dark and horrible oh, i don't want to see that it's not that um the dead really is memory there's a profound logic in what you described of cantor and me was that going to be the title of your book I, possibly possibly what i want to do there are lots of good books out there by academics about cantor so i don't want to add to that canon uh but what i want to do is to encourage schools and colleges to be inspired by his work by his legacy so i was going to write a bit about him and about me and him and then just write a whole series of lesson plans so they could take them and just take his ideas and, and run with them. Keep him going, keep his legacy going, because it should, I think. And of the many practitioners that you know about and have taught about, is, is he, I mean, Stan Laurel is my all-time comic hero, so I always anchor myself to that. As a practitioner, are you anchored mostly to Cantor or are there others? I'm no, not trying Stan to limit you. Massive to me, as you know, Stan Laurel's yeah. huge. Uh, I'm not anchored to anyone. Cantor, for the last 20 years maybe, has been the the main thing. But yeah, I, I take inspiration from everyone. I loved uh, Joan Littlewood. Absolutely loved Joan Littlewood and her quote, and this is not my big quote, but her quote about, uh, if you don't get lost, you'll never find a new route. I think it's great. I love uh, that. And I loved her whole approach to writing and theatre and Theatre for the masses, and I was very fortunate to get to meet and do some work with Clive Barker. I don't know if you remember Clive Barker. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, who was work? He worked with John Littlewood. He also worked with Brecht, or met Brecht. Um, we did some work with Manfred Veckworth, who was Brecht's assistant director, and and that was again. You think, oh, what? I'm in this room with these people. Um, so I get inspiration. I did a bit of work in Bristol with Augusta Boal when he was there, and it's just inspirational to hear these extraordinary human beings. But then it's as inspirational for me to have worked with wonderful students over the years. And I've just been as inspired by some work that students do and what they say. And I used to keep a book, I've, I, I don't know where it is now, of some of the things the students say. And they, sometimes through naivety, sometimes just pure intelligence, would come up with as profound a statement as some of these great practitioners. Lovely. And, and, and listening to you describe and talk about Cantor, it made me think of um, 
a theatre director as a sort of a, a puppeteer of the marionettes on stage? Because you talked about actors bringing different things with them and you mean different qualities, different attributes, different ways of seeing stuff. Yeah, and the thing is, though, when you, when you, if, yeah, it can sound like that. And you, there's two things when you talk about Cantor, people think because he was always on stage directing, even when you're watching a performance, which made the, the performances still part of the process, which I like. But people said, oh, doesn't that get in the way? But actually, it never, he never got in the way. You know, that was great. And also, when, when I've worked, I had Bogdan do some work with some of my students at the uni. And they thought that might be a bit limiting. Oh, we're waiting for Bogdan and it's we're just a marionette. But actually, they said it was the most liberating thing they've ever had. So if it's marionette, it's marionettes and the puppet master is letting them free. Beautifully put. Also, I remember, you know, again, the, the directors that have inspired and stimulated you. There was that rather funny story. You, you did invite me to come and do a comedy impro workshop with your students. Thank you. But why I'm telling the podcast audience that is I was quite jealous at the time because you'd recently had Stephen Burkoff in and then you would named a studio after him. And I was saying, where's my studio? And maybe you'd like to take the story from that point. <laughs> well, you wanted it. So I gave you it. We, we named the toilet after you. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a disabled toilet at the Somerset College of Art and Technology temporarily no, it's in Western it's in Western in Western Supermare sorry of course there was like Western Supermare it was only temporary of course because you ripped the sign out as soon as I'd left oh, <laughs> well you built the corridor mate yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. wonderful yeah. so um, uh, I'm just going to have to pull the blind down which has got nothing to do with the podcast but I'm getting blinded by the sunlight not your charisma yeah. just to be clear well is it is it is it, is it? Is it? yeah is it yeah, that slightly resembles, oh, it's a lot smaller. It does remind me of our room in, in Cricklewood. <laughs> well, the nook does. that I found myself in. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but without the David Bowie poster and the leg behind you on the, do you remember the leg? I do remember the leg and I picked that up at sixth form and why I carried a sort of mannequin leg with me, we'll, we'll never know. And thank you for bearing with me over those. And that's not as bad as, as me and you carrying a trestle table from your dad's office. In, in where Stanmore. was it? Stanmore. Yeah, all the way to Cricklewood. How the heck <laughs> we did that, I'll never know. Uh, yes, and that became many a, an essay uh, podium. Uh, and I was always struggling with my essays and would always come and ask for your help, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't the sharpest tool, but I've landed the right way up. Um, also, it's quite dangerous going to bed, I remember, uh, it just for the whole time that we spent together, because you would, you would just set up ridiculous booby traps of, of irons, ironing boards, gaffer tape on the wrong side of duvets we had a fight once and you ended up with a vase stuck on your head i remember uh, you weren't entirely innocent were you i think i was i think i am talking of no. the future of the oppressed this man no, has you, oppressed you, me you gave as much as you got mate excellent so listen thank you for letting us go down that sort of a very um comprehensive where you've got your stimulus from as to what you now bring in a in a incredible wealth and depth of experience to being a theatre practitioner which you said rather beautifully is your answer to what do you do now then you're, you're sort of carrying it forward as a theatre practitioner yeah wonderful so um if i may then we're going to join you in your clearing which i know we've got a guitar in which is of itself a beautiful storytelling metaphor and uh, we're going to shake your tree now to see which uh, stories fall out. And if you remember, it's a, a metaphor of an apple tree where we're going to shake your tree to see which apples fall out. And the apples take the form of this exercise called 54321, where you've had five minutes or as long as you needed to think about four things that have shaped you, three things that inspire you, two things that never fail to grab your attention. And then one quirky or unusual fact about you, Jed Stevenson, we couldn't possibly know until you tell us. So uh, don't panic, Mr. Manning. You don't have to sort of data dump and water borders with all stories at once, but you can go where you like, pick up whichever app you'd like to and start chomping on the open road. Where would you like to go first? Chomping? Well, we might as well just do it, you know, from four. What was the four one? Four things, four things that have shaped me. Yes, please. Oh, clearly food. No, um, <laughs> uh, I did write them down because I'd, I'd forget. Um, and thank you for preparing as well. Yeah. <laughs> I just wish I'd put some trousers on, but it doesn't matter, does it? <laughs> You've um, only got to look dressed from the waist up. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So, you know, in general. <laughs> um, bit of a breeze. Um, <laughs> uh, behave yourself, Jed. My parents... By the way, you are doing very well. I was slightly worried for all the obvious reasons. That <laughs> how will you behave 
wow. on a podcast that I'm doing 25 years. Many, you should many explain years. we used to do comedy together, and so there's a great danger that we might end up going back into a nonsensical. Yeah, there's a slight sort of, shall we say, tension in how I'm experiencing this, which is great. <laughs> now, I'm being well behaved so far, but you this, are. This, this time, this time. Four things that have shaped me clearly my parents. Uh, my mum, in that she, I guess whether I wanted to or not, took me everywhere. And don't forget, these are the days where it was buses mostly and lots of buses to get to places. So she took me, and this is hard to believe, I know when you hear me speak, she took me to elocution lessons. Um, Sorry? <laughs> I see what you did there. That's very good. Uh, it's about the level, isn't it? Yeah. Um, because there was this thing kind of in the, this would have been, oh gosh, mid, mid late 60s, uh, 1960s, Chris. And um, <laughs> where a lot of Northeastern mums in particular kind of perceived. Uh, um, that if they wanted their kids to get on, they had to kind of get rid of their accent. And I had a pretty strong accent in those days. And this um, would be a Geordie County Durham. County Durham accent, yeah. yeah. Darlington. And uh, yeah. And so, and, and in a sense, it was, I remember having an argument at Central about this. In those days, I, I call it pre off Wiedersen pet days. You know, before off Wiedersen pet, you didn't really get many regional accents on telly. It was all RP. And and bank managers were, were RP and you know, so on and so forth. So I went to elocution, which did nothing in terms of elocution, really, it was rubbish. But what it did was it, it started my love of poetry, because the guy there used to give us little kids loads of poems to read. And uh, I didn't come away going, oh, oh, I love poetry and anything like that. But I, you know, I love poetry now, and I think that started there. I remember having to do cargoes and also a crazy little poem for a little boy, which was, how far is the father a star? Can I get to it by car? I remember those two lines. So my mum took Would me say there. those again? I love that. Just reposition how, it. How, how far is the father of star? Can I get to it by car? That was the <laughs> opening lines of this poem. Um, and we did Cargoes um, and other poems. So I kind of liked that. And it started me getting up and, and... And when you say you did Cargoes, what do you mean by that? Sorry. It's a well-known poem, Cargoes. Okay. Um, but I'll admit as well, I can't remember who, who, who wrote it, but it's a well-known poem. Uh, that I just can't remember which about now. <laughs> um, you know, and it was my first time standing up in front of people and I kind of got the bugs there to kind of, I couldn't decide whether to say buzz or bug there, you may have noticed. Um, <laughs> stand up in front of people and suddenly I was going back to school and I was doing impressions and uh, I threw Louis Armstrong, a really good Louis Armstrong, by the way, with a plastic trumpet. Um and then she took me to dance. So I was tap dancing from about the age of five, I think, four or five. And she took me to youth theatre where I really got the book. And I think the book, the thing about Dalek Youth Theatre, that really shaped me. I was very young. And my mum and dad took me in the car. And they were very good. But they also said, no, you go in on your own. If you want to do it, you've got to stand on your own two feet. Uh, come out and let us know if you're going to stay or if you don't want to stay. And if you want to stay, we're going to drive away and come back at the end of the night. Um, which they never did. And I never saw them never after that. But then, <laughs> after, um, after, um, no. And I remember going in and the first guy I met, I don't know his name, a lot older than me. I'm, I'm used to being in a school where a, a really rough school and lots of bullying went on. I walk in, there's this big lad, much older than me with long hair an Afghan coat, the old hippie thing. And he came up and two things that stand out apart from that. He shook my hand and it's the softest hands I'd ever felt on a, a male. Because normally they were pretty strong and rough and hitting you, you know, really gentle and soft. And he said hi to me. And in those days, hi was definitely an Americanism. You know, we didn't say hi in the North Northeast. It was, hello, are you all right? Or worse. Uh, and it's like, oh gosh, he said hi. He smiled and he's welcoming his. So I lived down and told my mom and dad, yeah, yeah, I'm staying. Went in. And the first thing we did that night was uh, Roger, who was the uh, the guy in charge together with Janet, handed me a script. I stood in the line. And the first thing we did was a Monty Python script. And my world that day, just that moment, just changed. I'm there in the Northeast, used to rough and tumble at school and fighting and 
I'm going to get a job probably in a factory or something like that. And suddenly I'm amongst everyone's friendly. No one's going to beat me up. They're all saying hi. That wearing outlandish non-male clothes, you know, the whole Afghan coat, which I've, I've subsequently bought one. I've got long hair, which I did. I, I, I joined them very quickly on that. Um, and we're doing surreal comedy. And then to add to it, two weeks later, Roger left us and became a part of the band on Rainbow on TV. Good grief. And it was a real, oh, what's going on with my world? So that shaped me. And, and my dad's part of that is my dad's got a wicked sense of humour. I always say my dad's my hero, my best mate. He's got a ridiculous sense of humour, and I think I get my humour from him. Uh, and I yeah. know your dad obviously is still around, and I know, sadly, your mum isn't. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. But my, my dad kind of, yeah, has a, a crazy sense of humour. He's a very stoic guy, um, great footballer. And he, you could tell by his sense of humour because he dragged me to see Darlington play football when I was four. Which he thought was hilarious. Um, that also kind of shaped my life. So my mum and dad were number one. The second one... And, and so just to stop you, know, the, the idea of finding... Th the, the day you found theatre is a bit like a homecoming where you experienced kindness and a sort of uh, a sense of inclusion. Yeah, it was. It was because, as you say, I'm not the tallest guy. Um, and I was that? One of the, you know, <laughs> and I was at one of the roughest schools in the area. Uh, like people, I, I have mates who told me that they dreaded being picked to play for their school because it meant coming to our school and they hated that because it was so frightening and it was, you know, we had police at the door at the end of the day and all that stuff. So suddenly being in a friendly, happy, non-judgmental place and it was this thing called theatre. And Actually, do you remember I, the Monty Python sketch? I, no, I don't. No, I no. wish I did. Yeah. And, and I didn't have a clue why it was funny. It was just ridiculous. But... It was silliness, which I've loved ever since. And uh, people laughed, which is amazing. I'd never thought of doing comedy. And it's like, oh, my God, it's amazing. Mm. So, uh, and I stayed in Darling. I ended up, I didn't just, <laughs> it's that old advert, isn't it? It's the, uh, I forget the guy, the shaving advert. I ended up running the Dalek Youth Theatre. Oh, Victor Cayenne. I liked yeah. it so much, I bought the company. Yeah. I ended up, <laughs> when I was a professional actor, going back and running it in the evenings. Love that. So, uh, what goes around comes around. Yeah. So that, that, there's an adage I've heard recently, which is what's meant for you won't pass you by. So uh, your your parents' instinct to take you that day, you know, was was you know was a, a real epiphany, wasn't it? Yeah. And I, and the school were against me doing it. You know, the head teacher rang the Darlington Youth Theatre to, to try and get them them to stop me going there. Mm. Seems to think he could control me after school hours and. I shouldn't be there. I should be, you know. Also, the other resonance we have is Monty Python are so, so, so part of my comic DNA. You know, my, my first awareness that things like, you know, the Holy Grail and, and Life of Brian in particular are just astonishing moments of comic bliss almost. Yeah, and it was a, it was a time for me, and this was this would have been about, gosh, I think I would have been 11 or 12. So that's... Uh, uh, 69, 1970, 70, 71 maybe. Mm. Maybe a bit older. Because um, we met in 1982, I remember. So yeah, we did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's indelibly chiselled into my memory. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, as so it was, it was a big moment. And I just couldn't wait every... And I had a kind of a different persona when I went there. You know, school, it was rough and tumble. When I went to the Darlington Youth Theatre, I had a, either a duffel coat with a scarf or an, Af an Afghan coat. I grew my hair ridiculously long. Um, so you found more you found your authentic self rather than a sort of protective shell to survive a, a, a hostile environment almost it seems yeah and it, it taught me to dream and i remember one of the biggest insults i got was went around a mate of mine from school's house and his dad said this is a while later but his dad you know what are you going to do with your future and i said i want to get into theater into acting and comedy and uh he said to me and, and his son he called me a romanticizer, which I didn't actually know what it meant at the time. Now, so I found out what it meant, and, and that really hurt me. You know, someone called me a romanticizer, especially when I found out what it meant. I was like, oh, blimey, am I? That sounds a bit not solid. That's horrible. But then years later, I thought, no, what? You're saying to, so you must be saying to your son, don't dream. You know, so I ignored well, actually, it. Actually, he, he paid you a profound compliment that day by just yeah. naming something that, 
probably didn't have a kind intention, but actually what a great thing to be able to take on. Yeah. And, you know, and, and, and I would say to everyone out there, be a romanticizer, you know, dream and uh, do it. So yeah, it was, it was a big moment for me. Yeah. That one. Wonderful. So back to your tree, we're still shaking the apples of what's, what's shaped you. Yes. The second one, I was thinking about this, obviously. Um, <laughs> and I can't put any names to this. In fact, it only came back to me when I was thinking to it. I went to Durham College to do the A-level theatre studies, taught by two great Johns. Um, and, and actually, the class was really small. I'll just share this with you. We had a small class at the A-level. There was me. There was Dulcie Scott. I hope she didn't mind me saying this. So Dulcie went on to f- lots of success as a major... TV and film and Hollywood uh, costume designer. Wow. And she's worked on some of the biggest films. You know, she's amazing, Dulcie. And just remained you know, true to herself as well. There was Wendy Smith, who I remember her saying, I never remember Wendy being interested in music at all, but she fancied this lad called Paddy. So she eventually got off with Paddy and Paddy formed a band and put her in it. And they were called Prefab Sprout. Wow. <laughs> and Wendy's the, the female singer in Prefab Sprout. So, uh, and you know, so it was quite a successful small group. Um, and, and they brought in a, for a part time lecturer for like just a short series of workshops. This, this uh, woman who came in, and I don't know her name, and I really wish I knew her name. And I basically ripped off most of her workshops for the next 20, 30 years. Uh, she was extraordinary. She just did the wildest things. You know, the rest of the time we were learning about Stanislavski and Brecht and Arthur and Craig, and she came in and just did the uh, lights out, scare the hell out of you, uh, trust exercises, you know, all, all, all the stuff we and I take for granted. And it's like, what's going on, you know? And by the way, I'm supremely aware as a practitioner, you too are people that will borrow from. There is that adage, there's no such thing as an original idea. But you know, personally, I use stuff that I got from you in the time that I met you because you just arrived at Central just about, it was like you were five or six years more experienced than the rest of us. So it's very, very profound. So what, what you took on board, you were then very generously sharing. Yeah, but, but it really was. This, this person had a massive, and I didn't realise it at the time. I was thinking about it last night. It, it's... She did some extraordinary things, you know, just the whole thing of um, meditation and stuff and lying on the floor and closing your eyes and imagining mm. your thinking. And So you don't remember who that was, but you just remember how they made you feel. It wasn't, wasn't with us for long, Chris. She was only there for about, I think she was only there, I might be wrong, for about six weeks and just did a series of workshops. What a profound influence to have had to have turned up almost as the, the unknown practitioner who gave you so much. Yeah, yeah. No, it blew me away. So that's number two. And is there any way you can find out who that was? I typed in and Google the other day, a uh, woman who taught me at Durham College. And for some reason... <laughs> uh, it was actually me in a dress, you need to know. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> nah, no, nah, not unless... Um, I'm not in touch with Dulcie or Wendy or uh, any of the guys from A-Level. Uh, but you know, maybe they might remember. But... Um, well, maybe it's worth finding out because that's 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 a big thank you for somebody someday to know that well, it, this is the it, impact I've had. It is. I did write a thank you letter to a, a to a teacher I had at a, a prim, a primary school called uh, Terry Anderson. When I was teaching, I thought, no, I just want him to know what I'm doing because he was a great teacher at uh, mm. primary school. And Terry, every time he had to leave the the room to go to the staff room, would ask me to stand in front of the class and entertain them. Uh, and he was a big inspiration. So I did actually write a letter to him, but I'd like to, you know, it'd be nice to get in touch with her. Yeah. What a great nudge for you as well, because the number of times I've experienced your ability to stand up in front of an audience and entertain them, because I know that you, you've done folk singing. I'm not just blowing smoke at you, but that, that's such an interesting thing for a, for a teacher to see the potential of. That's yeah. the one that needs to stand up and entertain. And then that equips you for the rest of your life. I mean, what a profound story about the power of drama. Yeah, he was, he was a top guy. He was just, uh, yeah. I don't know what to call him now, year four at drama school, at, um, mm. sorry, at, uh, at primary school. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was great. Number three? Number three, please. Cashier number three, please. <laughs> <laughs> this is very vague. Music. It's, yes. You know, music has uh, been, uh, shaped me hugely. I kind of, 
more than anything, more than theatre, music is profound and integral to everything I do. It's uh, If this I've was got... a musical, this would be a perfect sort of ramp up to, and now I sing. Yeah. Music was yeah. my first love. Yeah. <laughs> Please don't. Um, <laughs> yeah, I just, you know, I don't know where I'd be without music. It's it's really important to me. And I'm not a snob. If, if I like a sound or a tune, then I like it. Um, but yeah, but equally I'm, yeah, I just find music to take you somewhere else. Just takes you. Uh, recently, uh, my my wife got um, congratulations. This is a wife of a week old. She's she, not a week old, just to be clear. But it... she's not a week old. No, no, no. <laughs> um, she bought me for my birthday, amongst many things, uh, the latest album by Steve Hackett, who used to be the guitarist in Genesis. Yeah, I was going to say you got me into Genesis. It was yeah, amazing stuff. Big thing. So, I, and it's eight sides of, of, of LP. And I just sat for a, uh, a whole afternoon and just closed my eyes and listened to the album, you know, and it's kind of those kind of moments, you know. Well, you've you've just re-experienced and re-emerged yourself in that, have you? I know you yeah. knew the music, but you just got bought it to remind you of that. Again, this sort of DNA of music is fascinating. Yeah, you know, and there's moments of gigs. Uh, a lot of times when I go to a great gig, I close my eyes to try and keep it in there, the memory. I close my eyes thinking, wow, this is something special. And that could be a folk singer in a little room. I'm a massive fan of the late, great Vin Garbutt. Yes. As you know, who uh, my first ever solo gig was bottom of the bill and he was top of the bill with Teesside Fetless. To to Genesis, to Joni Mitchell, to The Faces, to, you know, world music. And I just love music. I, I will listen to anything. So. And we went to Bowie and Elton John together at Wembley Stadium. Um, I remember watching Live Aid on the telly, but I think you were there, weren't you? Yeah. Yeah, you, yes, were back, you were back in the house in Cricklewood. I was watching, I was recording it all, shoveling in lots and lots and lots of VHS tapes to make sure that I'd recorded it all for yeah. you. No, I was, I was there at Live Aid and it was... Uh... And then we went to a Nelson Mandela gig as well, didn't we, when he first... That was extraordinary, when we walked yeah. out on stage. Yeah, we're almost, it was the first sort of auditoria of a huge stadium that, that were able to hear his first words of freedom yeah. almost in a yeah. stadium arena. We were all in tears and everyone was hugging each other. It was extraordinary, that gig. We also went to see Bob Dylan at Wembley Stadium. And that was the week after we saw Elton John. Do you know what I'm going to say? I probably, yes. So we, went, we went to see Elton John. And when we left the Elton John gig, uh, went down the tube. It was genuinely frightening, wasn't it? It was about 80 yards nice. trying to get the tube. We were all petrified. So the following Saturday, we went to see Bob Dylan at Wembley Stadium. <laughs> and he finished. And you said, I'm going back because we had to get the tube to Kilburn and then bus to Crickwood. And I said, no, don't go. It'll come back and you'll do an encore. And you said, yeah, but you'll probably only do one. And I don't want to go through the hell of the previous week. So you went to my stage. <laughs> and I came back and you, just, you said, did he do an encore? I had to break the news to you that he'd done 10 encores and that he brought on Chrissy Hind, Van Morrison, Carla Santana and Eric Clapton. <laughs> 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 Monumental fuck ups I have made. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. But I've got the tube home, all right. That's the important thing. I've got well, a home safe. Yeah. I've yeah. got a home safe. That was the upside. Sure. Without being a bit crowded. Yeah. Anyway. So that, number three. And then number four is the obvious one uh, for me and you. That's Stan Laurel. You know. Love that. Top man. He, he went to school in Bishop Auckland. I went to school in Bishop Auckland. So that makes me as good as him. Um, so, yeah, I have a connection with a man and I'll read anything and everything about him like you. I've read, we used to have posters on our uh, bedroom wall about with Stan and, and Ollie and, and Chaplin and all the Keaton and people. I watched a really good documentary about Keaton again the other day. Um, yeah, I mean, Stan Laurel, what can you say? Yeah, just, yeah, just a complete and utter legend. Fantastic. I think a brilliant actor. Yeah, I think Ollie, Ollie's, Ollie's Stan and Ollie and Buster Keaton and... Uh, were great actors. Rather, I don't think we should limit it to just being comedians. And yes. Samuel Beckett recognised that. You know, he uh, he wrote a, a film, didn't he, for for Buster Keaton? Yes. Um, and he realised that, you know, I mean, Stan and Ollie were Estragon and Vladimir. Absolutely. You know, the, the originals. I couldn't agree more. That's waiting for. They are the originals within almost. That would be perfect casting. Yeah. Indeed. You know, you know, Morecambe and Wise were due to do it. I remember you telling me that. Yes, we went. We went to the Eric Morecambe tribute, didn't we? 
That Yeah, we saw uh, Ernie Wise come on stage for the first time since Eric Morecambe's death. And we were positioned so, so, so high up that we had a, we had a in just by extraordinary coincidence, we had a bird's eye view that nobody else in the whole theatre space could see. We saw him pacing up and down, looking incredibly, you know, sad, stressed, yeah. forlorn before he walked up and down the steps. And then he spoke the words of bring me sunshine. Yeah. Um, yeah. And... Uh, the rumor was that they were about to sign up to do it in the West End, and that would have been incredible. But yeah, Fran yeah. Laurel, yeah, huge. And did you play Estragon or Vladimir when you did it? Estragon. Estragon. Yeah. Because interestingly, I, I was talking to someone on on the podcast, the Good Listening to a week ago, someone called Tweedy the Clown, uh, who you yeah, met, I saw that. he similarly has played Estragon as well. So you're, hey. you're he and you are both in illustrious company. If Laurel and Hardy were going to do it too. Yeah, and I was speaking a few years ago to Mike Harding. Another one of my heroes, comedy heroes, yes. and uh, he he toured that as well and did that. Uh, interesting, Tweedy said, "You said that Tweedy had tweeted about where the clowns go during lockdown." Yes, yes. And I'm currently writing a play about a clown who's in lockdown, <sighs> and not just that, but it's his final gig, and he was about to do a, um, a celebration of his life after 40 years as a clown, and it was all lined up with lots of mates coming in to do. Uh, tributes and bits of acts and he was going to do his final ever act and then uh, his, his agent suggests that they'll they do it on zoom and he, he's having to cope with working his act act out and doing his act on his own just in front of a computer so that's what i'm over halfway through writing at the moment wow that's like a world exclusive right here what a fantastic you know, thing it's, and, it's called, roll called up, roll up. it's yeah. called roll up roll up yeah, beautiful yeah. Yeah. I, that's so lovely uh, I'm just slightly moved by that that's fantastic that you're doing that and oh, we'll find out yeah. where we can look up that towards the end so back to your tree what's next uh, three three things that inspire you I mean well, we've, we've touched on one but um, uh, the Dalai Lama inspires me I, I describe myself these days as a bad Buddhist. <laughs> that, you know, uh, he bad did let Buddhist. me into Buddhism. Like, yeah, he said, uh, Buddhism isn't religion, it's a way of life. And I thought, oh, that, well, okay, that's cool. I don't mind that if you're not a religion. Uh, and I, I was always drawn to Tibet as a kid, and I don't know why. And I, I could, to this day, I can't tell you why. Uh, you're trying to let someone in. Oh, um, <laughs> the light's a bit weird. <laughs> 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 um, I don't know That's why. Been like that Tommy Cooper joke to the right. What? What? Well, you shouldn't be in there, should you? I <laughs> yeah, yeah. was going to come in the window. Yeah. <laughs> we used to love yeah. Tommy Cooper as well. Sorry, sorry. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, adored him. We, yeah, brilliant. Um, yeah, Tommy Cooper, Dalai Lama. I could have picked either. Um, you know, they haven't done the book of his jokes yet, but I'm sure they will. Um, but I ended up. I went to Tibet, and and uh, I've been inspired by some Buddhist writings and teachings. I try to meditate, but I'm really bad because I do drink alcohol, which you're not supposed to do. You're a bad Buddhist. But I'm, I bad Buddhist. <laughs> I'm rubbish at meditating. I haven't done it. For, I've done it for many years, but, um, but the Dalai Lama just inspires me because he just... And I'm, by the way, I'm quite proud of myself. I didn't say masturbating then, but, which was what yeah, I began. Well, I you. left you a gap there, but you, yeah. Um, I just think it's just his... Uh, his attitude, his smile, his, his his laughter, his calmness when confronting some ridiculously outrageous and quite infuriating situations. And he just smiles and finds a succinct way to deal with it. Um, mm. He just offers compassion and empathy and love. And I just think, how can you not be... Uh, that, what's really evocative is that idea of wisdom being there's an adage where the best instructors the best teachers wear their knowledge really really lightly so they don't yeah. need to be demonstrably wise they just are, are able to use uh, gravitas and depth of experience and silence really well yeah and it just kind of i would love to be in a room with him one day obviously that's not going to happen when we're going around tibet they don't forget the tibetans have never seen the dalai lama or a picture of him since he left as a kid when he escaped. And everywhere you go, they'd come up to you and they'd say, um, Dalai Lama, and they'd do this, because they wondered if you as a Westerner had a picture of what he looked like now. 
but if you gave him a picture, you were putting their life in peril. Could you show one though, if you had one on you? So no, you didn't know who was watching you. Okay, it was clear that we were being followed anyway. So uh, yeah, yeah, so we couldn't do that. But um, yeah, I mean, my first night in Tibet was funny in that uh, we were, I'd learned Tashi Delhi, which is a, a greeting. And it was really dark, and we're walking through the streets, and there's all these kids and grannies and that running up to us, these strange Westerners, stroking me on my chest and my arms, and they're all going, po, po, and laughing. And I thought, oh, po must be like a shortened version of, like, hi, instead of good evening. And I'm saying, po, po, back to them, you know? <laughs> and then I spoke to our interpreter, who was our guide, and I said, what does po mean? And it means monkey. <laughs> Because uh, most males in Tibet uh, don't have body hair. Ah, okay. And uh, I've got a bit, you know, quite a bit. So uh, Half man, half rug. So they were stroking yeah. you and calling you the monkey. The Dalai Lama was, yeah, yeah. Was a big inspiration. Continues to be, yeah. And then, is that the end of those three? Yeah, so the sec second one, obviously, is my wife. Uh, because, um, not just because she's my wife. Um not just because she's slightly out of view with a gun, but... Um, <laughs> Is she close by listening? She, she's downstairs. Okay. Um, but I just think as a human being, she, and she's a, 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 a Buddhist as well, but she, again, is very compassionate, far more than me, and very empathetic. And, um, and you've just discovered each other quite recently which is why it's so lovely because you're, you're only a week in having got married aren't you yeah we didn't just discover each other we've known each other. we've been going out for two and a half years but yeah mm -hmm. um yeah we didn't just meet a week but ago. in your journey in your journey to now i mean it's she's quite she's, she's a beautiful piece of your future but also very quite recent history yeah um but you know she she can always see the positive and will always strive to see the positive in things um and clearly likes a challenge but um, he's, yeah, she's just fun and funny to be with. She's inquisitive, always wants to learn. Uh, she's very knowledgeable, but she won't say that she is. Um, and she will always smile and, and laugh. And she's great to be in the room with. So she continues to inspire me every day. And number three, we've already spoken about Tadius Cantor. Lovely. That, that finishes that tree or that apple or that plant. and then the next thing to chomp on is uh, two things that never fail to grab is your it a attention banana tree? big pardon is it a banana tree or it could be not... a banana tree it's a tree of your choice really as yeah. long as you're shaking it and things are popping out it's all good oh, okay. okay so two things that never fail to grab your attention um i missed that one out i've got it <laughs> there, but, um so i'll let you just come up with something now two things that never fail i've got it written down but for some reason, I didn't. Yeah, why didn't I write that down there? Anyway, two things that never failed never failed to grab my attention. Uh, a great piece of music. Excellent. Well, you know, there are certain songs to this day that I've heard hundreds of times, or bits of songs where I can do nothing. I have to stop to listen to. And I'll give you an example: Ronnie Wood in the Faces. Um, there's a live recording of them doing. Uh, I would rather go blind. And he does his guitar solo in, the, solo in the middle where he makes the guitar weep. And I can do nothing. I just have to just zone out. It takes me. I can't ever have it in the background. So great music will always grab my attention. Uh, and great comedy. Great comedy. You know, I, I have so much respect for anyone who does comedy. Um, That's why you've always liked me so much. Well, no, I was just going to say, I think you should try it. Um, <laughs> but, um, you're, you're, by the way, I can't not say that. But well, I didn't know I was going to say this. But the number of times you've come to the instant wit shows that, I, or anything I've done, you, you'll always make a point of sitting there with the newspaper. <laughs> In the front Whenever of I come on, you just get out a newspaper, and, and you've got a whole tribe of your students once to all turn up. And as I walked on stage, there was sort of a, <laughs> a whole bank of people in the auditorium with the newspaper open you know it's, it's a gift you should go with it thank you um, very much yeah comedy you know that's what we share i think um you know joking apart we've spent many a night just watching videos in the old days oh, well, probably yeah vhs 
and do those, uh, uh, YouTube and just laughing or telling to the jokes or sending to the text of jokes. Um, with hindsight, we always used to have this slightly strange gag that we could have been because it was before they were around. We could have been, we'd be like a crap version of Anton Deck who'd let themselves go a bit now. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're, we're a bit like uh, Reeves and Mortimer as well in many ways. Um, so we used to do the cabarets at the Central School of Screech and Trauma, didn't we? So We did, we did. And it was just fun. And I used to love doing it. And the last time we ever performed together live, I don't know if you remember when that was. Tell the audience, please. You I'll know. catch up. Okay, it was at Olivia Olivia's uh, wedding. Oh yes, a good friend of ours, the vicar, yeah. Olivia Coles. Yes, who yes. shared a flat with us too. Yeah. So uh, yeah, we managed to convince us to get back together and do a, a little bit. Of a I think there's a, there is a film of that somewhere. I'll I'll, oh, I'll give her a nudge and say because she's based in Cambridge and, but I I saw her just a few months ago before the zombie apocalypse started. Good stuff. She's all right. Yeah. She's all right. Yeah, indeed. Um, that was the last, yeah, that was the last time we did that, but. We have we share a passion of just comedy, and I just love ah oh, just comedy, comedy and music, you know. Yeah, so that, those are the, the those are the two that so never failed to grab my attention. Lovely, I'll, I'll grab your attention in a minute with the next thing, which is could a quirky or unusual fact about you, uh, Jed Stevenson, we couldn't possibly know until you tell us, please. Yeah, I've got one there that's a bit deep. Uh, so I don't know if I want you to go deep. I just keep it a bit mind of um, it's not deep. But, uh, or whether I should just give you something else. That's, no, go uh, deep. Go deep. Go deep. Uh, which is, uh, I don't know if I told you, I don't know if we've had this, we might meet, you might know this, possibly, but very few I, I, I know this, which is when I was born, uh, I was supposed to die. Did I tell you this story? Uh, you live to tell the tale, certainly. Did he? Tell us more. Um, my mum my, my had, various complications and my dad was given the news that he could potentially lose his wife or his son to be or both um and it was very complicated and uh but but we obviously we, he didn't thank god and i was in an incubator for a while and i was born with a twisted spine which i've had all my life which has made it very difficult for me to do because i did clowning for many years i still do clowning but i used to do kind of uh, slapstick clowning uh, and actually rolling is hard for me because of my twisted spine uh, to this day. And and that has kind of been a big, uh, the elephant in the room for me is having a twisted spine, um, oh, which I still have now. But interestingly enough, when I was about 18, me and my dad were going to a football match and we'd never ever spoken about it. We're driving in and obviously this was the moment my dad decided to tell me. And he said, look, and he, he, out of the blue started to tell me this really quite traumatic thing for him about, you know, your mum, and you're difficult. And I got the news that she, she might die, my, my wife might die, and you might die, uh, or I could one the other. And he told me this whole story in the car, really quite moving. And genuinely, he paused, and he didn't mean it for comic value. And he said, in, with sincerity, he said, but, but luckily you lived. <laughs> 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 I was like, oh, Dad, that, oh, I love a happy oh, end. Phew, what happened? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I was, I was on the edge there, you know. So, yeah, that's something you don't, I don't really talk about. Nice fact. Um, and much deeper than a fact like, in my case, if I wasn't called Chris, I was going to be called Pamela. <laughs> it's not about me. Well, well yeah, that. yeah, yeah, I can see that. Thanks. Uh, just call me Pam. Yes, yeah, so now we're going to take you away. So we've shaken your tree. Hurrah. And now we're going to talk about alchemy and gold. And we're accelerating slightly now. When you are truly at purpose and in flow, Jed Stevenson, what is it you most like to bring to the world? What, what's alchemy and gold for you? Just to make, I don't know, if people smile and feel a bit happier when, the, when I've left the room, then that's fine by me. It's all it is. It's all, all it is. If people feel they didn't waste their time, whether it's coming to see a show uh, or whether just I go for a coffee or I bump into a stranger in the town, uh, if they just feel a little bit happier at, you know, at the end of it, then that's, that's great. That's, that's my reward. Beautifully put. And now I'm going to award you with a cake, Jed Stevenson. 
as your oh, reward I for having lose weight. What are you doing to me? <laughs> and um, what it is is uh, the opportunity for you to put a cherry on the cake of this conversation. It's the legacy of this conversation. Um, even though you've done a brilliant, that was just lovely what you just said. However, the cherry on the cake now is yours to interpret as a final storytelling metaphor, where it's um, the best piece, the best piece of advice you've ever been given. It could be a favourite inspirational quote. Or maybe advice to a younger version of yourself. It's sort of open to interpretation. But what would you like your cherry on the cake to be? This is easy. I'd say this to a lot of people. It comes from Augusta Boal, who was an extraordinary person. And in one of his books, he says, and I think it's really profound, but it sounds very simple. And it's linked to what I've just said. And he said, um, have the courage to be happy. And I think that's brilliant because I think it does take courage to be happy. You know, people say, I'll oh, be happy. But actually, for a lot of people, it, it does take strength and courage. So I think have the courage to be happy is uh, is the cherry, if you want it to be a cherry. Uh, or um, could be could be the ice cream on the uh, banana split. Or the, um, how far do you want me to go with this? But yeah. <laughs> it's up to you when you stop, dear. Lovely. <laughs> That's a lovely cherry on the cake. Thank you. So where can we find out more about you, Jed Stevenson, on the interweb? I, I know well, where you live, so I can come and punch you in the yeah. myself, but I don't have a website. I've kind of resisted that for a long time, really, because um, I don't like bizarrely being centre of attention. I, I don't know if you remember when we used to do, we we did Caucasian Chalk Circle in London. And I played Asdaq, and the director used to get really angry with me, because when we came out to bow... We were about in a semicircle. Yes. Going to the, and I used to position myself there so hardly anybody saw me. Even though I just dominated this, the second half of Asdaq. Yeah. It, it wasn't about me getting work. So I don't have any center of attention. So I don't really have a, a website. I'm Clearly, I'm on Facebook. Uh, myself and a wonderful clown called Leela Bunce have formed a, uh, a theatre company a few years ago called Shoebox Theatre Company. And we've got a, a Facebook page. I think we might even, I don't know if you have a, I don't think we have a web page, but we've got a, a, a Facebook page. So you can find out bits about us there. Oh, and by the way, you've just triggered a memory of I was the corporal in that same production that you're talking about, the Caucasian Chalk Circle. And we, we very uh, famously of its time did um, a, a version of Midsummer Night's Dream where we were the rustic Shakespeare company, the RSC. You were bottom and I was quince. And that was a really, I used the Peter Quince uh, monologue to get me into the Bristol Olvic Theatre School. So being in that production with you was incredibly seminal because uh, we, we, you know, we, we played, you know, it went down very, very well. And then I remember that, that served me well for, for where I went next. That was a great show, that wasn't it? it that was. Midsummer Night's Dream. Bill was in it as well. Bill Bailey, yep. And uh, I don't know, was Jonathan in it? Yes, Josh Darcy, as he's now known. Yeah, who went on to work with Ken He's Campbell. become a major foil of Ken Campbell, or yeah. uh, now sadly deceased, did, not did Josh. Polly, did Polly direct that? Polly Thomas. No, it was, um, oh, now Easy Tiger, uh, Joe Carter, I think it Joe was. Joe directed it. Of course she did. The wonderful Joe Carter directed it, yeah. Lovely. That was a great show. And, and they, uh, Kate Firth was in it as well. Colin Kate was, Firth's Kate was Titania. Yeah. So the, the, I, I used to look forward to rehearsals for Bot and Tit, and... Um, no one's yeah. ever thought of that gag in those parts before. No, clearly. Bottom but, tip. Yeah. And I, what I really liked about Joe's direction is she basically let me get on with it as bottom. So I, I remember running out of the theatre one night. You did let rip. I... <laughs> <You're>... <laughs> See what I did there? I yeah. didn't know I was going to say that your bottom did definitely let yeah, rip. Yeah, pretty good. Knob yeah. gags. <laughs> and I remember yes. seeing everyone on stage thinking, where are you going? Just run up we we never knew where you were going, and that was part of the magic. So, listen, thank you so much for the uh, gracing us with your presence here on the Good Listening to podcast. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to say, dear? Before I, well, exit? it's been it's been a joy and a pleasure, Chris, seeing you and spending time in your company. It's kind of uh, surreal. No, it's good to see you, and uh, yeah, it's fun. It's fun. It? It's good to reflect. You've been listening to the Good Listening To podcast with me, Chris Grimes. This has been Jed Stevenson. Thank you very much indeed and good night. <laughs>